welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk today about field cycling, relaxometry and nanomaterial science. I'd like to thank Danuta and the Euralex people for the invitation and also Jenny and the guys at Stellar. Uh, Can you speak louder? I'll speak, I'll speak louder. Okay, um, I'll tell you a little introduction about magnetic nanoparticle suspensions and MRI. Then I'll talk briefly about field cycling because I think most of the people in the audience are, are, are knowledgeable enough. And then I'll give you two sets of examples on magnetic, magnetic nanoparticle dispersions and magnetic nanoparticle assemblies with a focus, as Danuta is saying, on the MRI application. Okay, so in the group we make iron oxide nanoparticles. These are uh, spherical or cubic nanoparticles. Um, spherical or cubic nanoparticles of uh, magnetic iron oxide. Gamma Fe203. Um, 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 got a lot of feedback from someone there, Petra. Right, let's say for simplicity, the polymers of linear polymers. These are um, very cubic scattered and in a tactic way with different yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. I'm getting a huge yeah. amount of because it is that inter. Okay, I'll try to keep going. Um, so we have gamma Fe2 from a random separation. The aggregate, the interaggregate distance. We're Fe304 magnetic backrust and sometimes it's a bit of I'll try to control the particle size between 4 and 18 nanometers. Uh, we try uh, to make the particles as monodisperse as possible because the magnetic properties are size dependent. Um, and then we try to assemble them into clusters uh, with control size. And if you can do that successfully, we have control over size on two dimensions, the particle size and the cluster size. So a lot of the work is about electron microscopy. A lot of the work is about dynamic light scattering, which tells us the hydrodynamic size of the particles as they tumble through suspension. And of course, there's the magnetic resonance side, which gives us the MRI efficacy, as Danuto was saying. But also I hope to show you today a little bit more about how we learn about the magnetic ordering and the magnetic properties of these particles in suspension by the field cycling technique. Okay, so if you look at magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles in the literature, you'll find there's a huge literature uh, covering drug delivery, MRI, uh, hyperthermic responses. So hyperthermic responses are when you put particles in an AC magnetic field in the kilohertz range. We get localized heating of the particles, but not of the body and of the tissue surrounding them. So that can be actually used for cancer ablation and that has been done palliatively. Uh, people are also uh, trying to apply that hypothermic, uh, that heat that's localized to deliver drugs off nanoparticles and to deliver drugs from hydrogels. And that in fact is where much of the work of my group is at the moment. But in principle, one aspect, this magnet magnetization of these particles enables a drug delivery, perhaps hypothermia and tracking diagnostically. So you have a potential to have a multifunctional, a, a theranostic vehicle just by making these iron oxide nanoparticles. So that's much of the reason why there's strong interest in this field today. Uh, and in the group, we do do fields, fields we, we do the MRI. I won't talk about it much today. We do it in, in conventional seven Tesla uh, instruments and we do it at ultra low field as well. But well, essentially, uh, I'll just very briefly describe to, to you what this MRI application is. So an, 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 MRI, an MRI image is a, is a digital image uh, where one pixel within the image corresponds to one voxel or one volume element within the slice through, this, through, the, uh, through the specimen. And the br pixel brightness is related to the proton field strength and the proton response uh, from bodies arises from water or fat. And there's the spectrum that we'd expect to see in, in NMR. That would correspond to a pixel that's bright. If you reduce the intensity, you'd represent that as a darker and a darker and, and actually no intensity whatsoever in a, in a black pixel. If you, look at, if you look at the body, if you look across uh, to a transection through the veins here and into the gray matter, the proton content, the concentration doesn't change that much. So the difference arises because of contrast due to the differences in T1 and or the T2 relaxation types brought about by the microenvironment and enhanced in many cases by the presence of agents, as in the example here. We have two types of, of, of MRI. There's, uh, there's T1 weighted and T2 weighted MRI for contrast. T1 weighting normally is gadolinium, co gadolinium complexes are used. I won't be talking about that. But single particles dispersed, separated from each other in suspension of iron oxide have been investigated for this application. 
in this situation, the presence of the nanoparticles shortens the T1. So in that part of the body, it's not possible to saturate the signal from the NMR by reducing the relaxation delay. So it's a selective non-saturation due to the presence of the particles is the basis of this T1 effect. If you assemble the particles into clusters, you generate a very large global moment and that dominates the processes that reduces the spin lattice relaxation T2. So clusters are used as T2 agents and these have been used clinically. I'll show you some examples in a moment. In this case, we're looking at a negative contrast agent. The agent, the signal from the part of the body that contains the agent is rapidly dephased. So this process is dependent on the echo delay. Um, so uh, I'll jump forward. Essentially, the why, the super, why the individual particles give rise to this positive contrast is because they are super paramagnetic. And that means that in the, in the absence of a magnetic field, as indicated here, the moment is free to move. Uh, and when you reduce the magnetic field plotted here horizontally, the magnetization of the sample drops to zero very, very rapidly. Or to put it another way, every particle within the suspension is thermodynamically independent of every other particle. If you make clusters, then there are dipolar interactions and perhaps also exchange interactions between the particles. And that means that when the, uh, when the external magnetic field is removed, some magnetization remains as shown here for the blue curve. So these are ferromagnetic nanoparticles. And as far as, t as relaxation times for NMR is concerned, they behave really quite differently. So uh, we need to control the colloidal state. We need to avoid aggregation if we're after T1 rating. Uh, and we need to control the aggregation to give us good relaxation if we're going for the T2 weighting. Okay, so clinically, uh, people went after T1 agents quite strongly uh, 15 years ago. They went after VSOP C184 is what it was called. Citrate stabilized, I think seven nanometer iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, worked quite well. What they were after was blood angiography, so blood pool mapping. Um, I think the, the response was quite good, but there was little possibility of active targeting. I think the, the washout was too quick. They didn't circulate for long enough. Um, Resovist has been used, a T2 agent, which is a carboxydextran stabilized magnetic nanoparticle cluster. It has been used for uh, applications in, in, in liver imaging. It gets very rapidly transported to the liver, so its blood circulation time is moderate. There are efforts to try to improve this material ongoing. There's a material going back into clinical trials whereby they're trying to control the size of the clusters and they're trying to use that then for uh, liver cancer staging. Uh, and there's good, 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 uh, good reasons to think that that might work quite well. Um, the fact that these, these things have been looked at uh, for relatively simple materials that are not optimized or not very uh, sophisticated, have no active targeting and have uh, relaxivities or efficiencies for MRI that are below the theoretical maximum means that there's still possibilities for a new generation of agents. Uh, hence, the large interest in uh, MRI applications of nanoparticles even today. Okay, um, a little bit about field cycling. So conventionally we have our, our NMR at fixed frequency and we send in 90 degree pulses and we measure magnetization in, in the standard way. And then we have the field cycling instruments. Uh, we use the stellar field cycling instrument. We find it to be very, very strong, very good. It's been useful in the lab, uh, gosh, I, 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 it's not 20 years, but it's more than 10. Uh, I, I don't want to think how long we've had it, and it's been, it's been our, our workhorse. Uh, measurement of T1 between 10 kilohertz and 14 megahertz. Um, essentially, what we do for the MRI applications is that we have the relaxation time of the water. We invert that to get a relaxation rate. And there are two components to that. The first term here is the relaxation rate of water. And the second term is the enhancement due to the nanoparticles, which is going to be proportional to the concentration uh, of the particles present. So if we increase the concentration of the agent in a series of suspensions, measure T1, plot the rate against the concentration, the slope is this relaxivity value. It's the efficacy of the agent for shortening T1 or shortening T2. So there's a huge literature out there at the moment where people are trying to optimize T1 by using T2 values. Um, I won't go into T1 and dynamics. I think, I'll, 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 I think people are, are well aware of the fact that there's a T1 minimum for T1 for fixed field measurements where you vary the temperature. You get a T1 minimum for uh, fixed temperature variable frequency measurements, variable field measurements. We extract uh, dynamics from fitting curves like these. These are spectral density curves, essentially. And we have a, a standard relaxation uh, T1 formula shown here which contains contributions due to the strength of the dipolar interactions 
uh, that are moduli, uh, and then we have the spectral density contributions. So I'm not going to do a theory talk, talk, I'm going to talk more about applications, but just to show you that the, the spectral density is the Fourier transform of the time autocorrelation function. The time autocorrelation function asks the ensemble of particles, did anything happen yet? Did you move? For NMR, that means, did you rotate and modulate that dipolar interaction? Uh, for dynamic light scattering, which we'll see in a few minutes, it means, did you diffuse? Did you take a diffusive hop through the suspension? Um, if you have a single random and stochastic process. This time correlation function is a single exponential, it's a first order process. And that means, therefore, that the Fourier transform must be Lorentzian. So the spectral density is Lorentzian. And this is why we see this sort of behavior here. And as we increase the temperature, increase in dynamics, we move the spectral density to higher and on higher and higher frequencies. And this inflection point here is effectively the rate of the dynamic process. It's the inverse correlation time for the process that's driving the relaxation. So normally in uh, diamagnetic systems, you'll have decreasing functions. Uh, relaxation rate, capital R1, will be a decreasing function of frequency. Uh, and we could look at the different, uh, I'll skip over that, we can look at the fast and, 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 low, and slow field limits if we like. Let's move to what the topic of, the, of today is, the relaxation, the presence of superparamagnetic nanoparticles. This is, this is the sort of function that you record. So it's a relaxation rate as a function of field, which is frequency. <clears throat> or one's not a decreasing function of frequency, which is surprising. It suggests that there's two mechanisms driving relaxation. Uh, Robert Muller and Alan Roch, 21 years ago, believe it or not, wrote out a theory that's still pretty much the theory that's used today. Uh, relaxation rate is a function of all of these parameters. There are correlation times in here. Tau D, which is the Brownian correlation time, which relates to the distance of closest approach or and the diffusion coefficient, and the Neal correlation time for the reorientation of the point. And the Langevin function appears in here. I'll go through each of those now in a second in a graphical way to sort of show you how, how it works. So the low frequency proton relaxation arises due to fluctuations of, of the magnetic particles moment. This is the Neal contribution. So there's the moment, and it hops backwards and forwards. Uh, with a characteristic correlation time, which is the Neal correlation time. There's a barrier to that process, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy. And in the uniaxial case, the, the moment hops backwards and forwards. That gives rise to a standard or standard-ish spectral density function, which is a decreasing function of frequency, as shown here in red. Uh, were you to, and it dominates the low frequency part, were you to go to larger nanoparticles, that now that the Neal correlation time will get longer and the spectral density contribution would move to lower frequencies. So there's a size, going to be a size dependence to the Neal contribution. At higher frequencies, uh, the, relax the fluctuations that drive the relaxation are the motion of the water past the static moment of the, of the particle. It's the Brownian relaxation. It gives rise to a decreasing function of frequency as you would expect. Um, and that dominates the high frequency part of the spectrum. Uh, larger nanoparticles, uh, you'll have a longer uh, engagement time, a decreasing rate, and you'll see a change in the spectral density as indicated here. So again, both components are going to be size dependent. And really what happens is that the Neal dominates at low frequency, uh, where the moments are free to, to, to move because they're super paramagnetic. The Brownian motion dominate, the Brownian contribution to relaxation dominates at higher frequency, because the moments are locked to the external field. And then the Langevin function is sort of a waiting in function that waits between these two extremes. So we end up with a, a situation where you measure the T1 of the solvent, we invert it to get a rate, we divide by the iron concentration, and then we fit it to this approach using this theory from Muller. And this is the sort of fit that we get. Um, you can see that the fit is quite good, it's not perfect. Um, it's interesting to, to people like me who are materials, nanomaterials chemists, because it tells us something about the nanoparticles that are, that are in the suspension. So for instance, as you slow down the Neal correlation time, the theory says that this low frequency relaxivity should go up, and it's observed too. And that's correlated with an increase in this activation energy for the reorientation of the moment. Um, the core size, when that increases, this maximum in the mid-frequency range should move back to lower, to lower frequency. Now really what you're measuring is the inflection point here at high frequency, which is going to move back 
as the particle size goes up. But that moves the whole curve. A minimum is observed here for smaller particles because those two relaxation contributions are quite well separated in time and therefore frequency. And that is lost as you go to higher and higher particle sizes. And then the last thing is that the saturation magnetization, which is a measure of how crystalline the particles are, scales the whole curve up and down. So you can extract all of these parameters, perhaps by analyzing a curve, uh, an NMRT profile or a field cycling profile, but you need to be a little bit careful. So um, I think I'm probably zooming along quite quick, but okay. Uh, let's look at some examples for uh, FFC and more of magnetic nanoparticle dispersions. Heptane suspensions, not water, heptane suspensions of dispersed particles. So there's a lot, good while back, uh, in 2008 we did this. So you take a, a precursor and some fatty acid, oleic acid, in phenyl ether, do a reaction at 265 Kelvin to, and to re-centigrate and you make, you make it red rust, gamma Fe203, nanoparticles stabilized by oleic acid. And by controlling the ratio of the, of the fatty acid, to the, the iron precursor, we can control the size. And here are the curves for uh, 3.4 all the way up to 6.3, nanometer uh, particles, that's the diameter, excuse me, by TEM, by electron microscopy. And we've managed to fit these curves quite well using Mohler's approach. Um, and what we try to do is we fit the high frequency end, we fit the low frequency end, and we don't worry too much about the intermediate part where the interpolation between the two extremes is done. Uh, we live with that. Um, are the measurements of any value, is there any, is there any possibility for validating them? So here for the same particles, the TEM size plotted as a function of the ratio of the, of the reactants. So we managed to make these five uh, different suspensions with different sizes. So the TEM size runs from around three up to around six nanometers. The dynamic light scattering size runs from around seven up to around 10. The slope of that line is the same, which is interesting. So the dynamic light scattering includes the uh, ligands that are stuck to the nanoparticle diffuse through the suspension. So the dynamic light scattering size will normally be significantly larger than, than, than the TEM size. The NMR size is really interesting. It follows the same curve. Uh, it follows the same curve, the same slope as the other two curves, and it's intermediate between them. So if you interpret this as at face value, you would say that this suggests that the solvent molecules get within about a nanometer of the, of the TEM surface. Um, that might be over-interpretation, but it seems to be consistent with the data. If you look at the saturation magnetization, shown here on the right as a function of uh, particle size, the red dots are the dots extracted from the NMR analysis, and the solid curve is the, is, are the curves from other independent experiments, and they're consistent with the expectations for maghamite of this size uh, using the TEM analysis as well. So it's saying that if you disperse the particles well enough, you can be semi-quantitative uh, with the values that you extract from the uh, field cycling profile. And we've shown one or two examples down to the years where that is the case. More often because of the limitations associated with the polydispersity of the samples or the non-applicability of the superparamagnetic theory because you're moving a slightly away from that regime where you start to have dipole interactions, it becomes a little bit fraught. But nonetheless, you can extract interesting information and that's what I'm going to try to show for you in the next 20 minutes or so. Okay, um, more routinely in the lab, we use this method to characterize our particles. So we're making particles for MRI, for hypothermia, for a range of different, different applications. Uh, so we pop them in when the instrument is running, which is most of the time, and we can do our, our characterization. We can extract uh, relaxation profiles that tell us something about this example. That bomb 24 hour data, I don't believe it, it's super, it's too, it's too strong. There's something, there was something up in that experiment, we weren't able to repeat it. But typically we see curves down similar to this black curve for 10 to 12 nanometer nanoparticle suspensions. And we can extract from that saturation magnetizations, but more realistically, we can say that this suspension is very similar magnetically to the one that we made last week. Therefore, for a given application, we can go and use that material. Okay. Uh, let's have a little look at the effect of clustering or assembly on, uh, of, of nanoparticles into MNPCs, into clusters, what that does. So as you uh, assemble into clusters are 43 or 57 or 89 or 121 nanometers, going blue to green to red to black, with similar polydispersity index. So this is the polydispersity from the dynamic light scattering. The lower that value, the more monodispersed the suspension is. Really, you want it to be below 0.15. So these are quite good suspensions. What's interesting is that as you increase the cluster size, yes, 
the maximum moves to lower frequencies, as you would expect. But in this case, the relaxivity increases as the hydrodynamic size increases. Okay. Here's another example. Uh, 65 nanometer clusters, very nice ones, 100 nanometers and 140 nanometer clusters. Uh, not the exact same, uh, the, the, the light cyan one is that one. Uh, but these are similar, the same process to generate uh, clusters as shown here in the electron micrographs. So an increasing size going from black to red to green to dark blue to cyan in this case. Again, the frequency of the maximum moves to lower frequency, <coughs> uh, as you would expect. But in this case, the relaxivity is going down. Our in the previous case, the relaxivity was going up. So our interpretation is that in this case, we have an impermeable core. Uh, so the solvent isn't diffusing into the center of the clusters. Whereas in the previous case here, because of the chemistry of this, of this material, it was a DHA, a dihydroscorpic acid stabilized material, it's water permeable. So the water is getting in through the suspension, in through the cluster and sensing most of the particles that are there. In this case, as the clusters get bigger, more and more particles are buried on the inside of the clusters and are not accessible to the water. So the relaxivity is coming down. Okay, so that's the effect of clustering on, the par on, on, on assembly. Um, let's look at dispersion for a little bit. There's some interesting things that can be seen there. Um, this is a thermal decomposition reaction to make magnetic nanoparticles called a PINA method. We then silanize these with a silane. So this is a difunctional or bifunctional silane. The silicon bit goes onto the iron oxide form of the silicon oxygen iron bond and the pendant epoxy or the pendant amine groups in glimo and aptes are pointing out into the suspension, which is THF. But then we add a polymer and transfer it into water. So we can add the polymer by adding a polymer and grafting it to. So in that case, it's a pegylated magnet, uh, pegylate, an aminated peg is added. The amine does a nucleophilic attack here, linking to the epoxy. We end up with polyethylene glycol, or whatever molecular weight we want, bound to the nanoparticle surface. In this lower case here, we have aptes. We add the polymer monomer by monomer. So it's a grafting from, grow the polymer from the amine group. In that case, we do a, a it's, it's a anchor boxy and hydride chemistry to generate a glycopeptide grafted magnetic nanoparticle. They have interesting properties themselves uh, for MRI and also because of the nature of the ligand on the surface. For this audience, so for ourselves, you've got to think a little bit of what's, what's, what's going on. You take the same batch of nanoparticles as what we did, we split them. In one case, we put on the glycopeptide by grafting from, in one case, we put on the peg uh, by grafting to. Uh, the polymers end up about the same molecular weight, so the hydrodynamic size is the same in these two cases because the core is the same, the polymers are around the same size. And the profiles are, are superimposable on each other. So it's a little bit of a word of warning. It says that the profiles are unchanged. The T1 weighting capability of the suspensions, at least in, in water, is unchanged. And both these are actually stable to, to reasonable ionic strength medium. Um, it suggests that the contrast is not a function of surface chemistry. There's an awful lot of literature out there. Uh, some of it's good. Uh, some of it, I wonder if the controls have been put in place to justify the claims of enhanced relaxivity because of surface effects when they haven't controlled in many cases for the uh, dynamic light scattering, for the aggregation of the particles. So if you have such claims or you're reading a paper from with such, when such claims are present, if there's no DLS, it might not be true, is, is kind of what I'm saying. So in this case, the contrast is not a function of the surface chemistry on the nanoparticle. Okay, um, keep going. We looked at magnetic nanofires more recently. Uh, these are sort of multi-grain nanoparticles, which are 35 nanometers in size, formed from 6, 10, or, or 12 grains, which are about 8 nanometer in size. We disperse them in this case with 2, 2K, 4K, 8K, or 20 kilodalton, uh, polyethylene glycol, stabilize them in water, and the hydrodynamic size is very good and it increases with the chain length as you would expect. Here's the profiles. So the profile, the NMR prof, NMRD profile, or field cycling profile, is independent of the chain length. So in this case, the hydrodynamic size increased. It wasn't due to aggregation, because if it was, then we would see a change in the profile due to dipolar interactions within, within the clusters that it formed. It also tells us that also in this case, the contrast is not a function of the surface chemistry. Um, uh, the, profile, the profile tells us that. 
Okay, let's look at another example. So we take iron oxide nanoparticles, we stabilize them with citrate or with aptes, and we do the dynamic light scattering. So citrate stabilization, so here's citric acid, uh, we conjugate it to the nanoparticle surface and we make a citrate stabilized nanoparticle. These are still, still acidic groups, so they're going to give away the protons right down to around pH 3. Um, and you'll generate a negative charge, which will increase as you increase the pH right up to about pH 10. So this is the zeta potential of surface charge plotted. So you're basically in the range 3 up to 10 pH units. You're going to have a negatively charged nanoparticle. So that nanoparticle will repel any other nanoparticles. You'll end up with a stable, electrostatically stabilized colloid in water. If you drop below pH 3, you start to protonate these negative groups. You lose your, you lose your uh, neg negative surface charge. The particles are now neutral. They start to stick together and the hydronomic size goes up, as you can see here. Um, so there's a wide size stability window. Now, Robert Muller did something like this before. We, we wanted to confirm and go a little bit further. So between pH 4 and pH 8.4, you see an increase in reactivity progressively. You can scale each profile by a factor and the profiles will overlap perfectly. Uh, so it says that there's a 30%, so this is a percentage enhancement of, of uh, reflexivity versus pH 4. Um, it's a 30% increase, interesting. If you look at the aptest nanoparticles, which are positively charged, the size stable, stable window is, is, is narrower, but between pH 1.8 and 3.35, here are the profiles. And again, we see an increase in reflexivity with an increase in pH. So it doesn't matter whether the particles are positive or negatively charged. As you protonate more, uh, sorry, as you deprotonate more, you, um, sorry, as you increase the pH, as you deprotonate, you start to increase the, um, you start to increase the relaxivity. So the loss of proton off the nanoparticle surface is enhancing the interaction of the, nano, of the water with the nanoparticles without changing any of the correlation times to the processes that drive the relaxation. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why that is. I, I, I suspect it's something to do with the surface free sites on the surface of the iron oxide, which, is, which, is, which, is, which are amphoteric, and they're free of the chemistry of the citrate or the app test in this case. But we don't see that for the polymers. Presumably the surface is, is uh, covered enough to prevent the protons and the hydroxides getting right into the, into the surface. That's an interpretation. It does say the contrast is a function of surface chemistry in this case, which is contrary to what I said before, but I think it's because in this case, the acid groups are accessing the actual naked surface of the particles away from the citrate and the, and, and the abtes. Okay, um, I thought this is an interesting experiment. So you take citric nanoparticles, and you put them in uh, acidic media and they dissolve really, really rapidly. If you put the silanated particles, the aptest stabilized particles in pH 1.8, they gradually dissolve over 40 days. And here's the profiles recorded uh, as a function of time over that period. And you can see the profiles decreasing, decreasing, decreasing and changing shape. Apparently. So I haven't scaled here. This is the relaxation rate, which is the inverse of the relaxation time. If we uh, dissolve them up faster by going to pH 0 0.5, we'll eventually get no particles. And that, in open red triangles, is the profile of the dissolute. So that's a mixture of iron-2 and iron-3 salts and some other muck uh, that's present, but there's no particles present at all in this suspension. So the OR1 is a function of time. It has two components. It has a component due to the nanoparticles, this first term here on the bottom, and it has a component due to the dissolute. So the iron-2 and iron-3 salts that are making up this, this lower profile. Um, if you look at the DLS, over time, here's a correlation function, so the Fourier transform of the spectral density for the diffusive process. Over time, the hydronomic size isn't changing. It's not an aggregation phenomenon, but the particles aren't getting smaller either. If you look at the count rate, uh, the count rate of light scattered back into the photo uh, multiplier tube, is dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. There's fewer particles. So the size isn't changing, but the count rate's dropping, so therefore you have fewer particles on the same size as a function of time. So we have from that, we know the initial iron concentration. We know how much the concentration is decreasing as a function of time. Uh, we measure R1 as a function of time, so we can extract the nanoparticle contribution to the relaxivity as a function of time, because that term, that term, that term, and that term are known. And when we do that, we get the same profile for all of these suspensions. So there's less and less and less of this nanoparticular component, but it's not changing. So the interpretation we put on that is that, you know, you have a condensed layer of aptes, 
provides a long, long term stability. Once the aptus layer is breached, uh, the particle rapidly dissolves. Uh, no expense spared, as you can see on the, on the, uh, on the cartoon. That was Owen McMahon, my student, who did a good job in fairness. I, I, should, I, shouldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, so once the particle is breached, it rapidly dissolves. The profile, there's no contribution from smaller fragments. So all of the particles aren't dissolving gradually. Some of the particles are dissolving very rapidly, and the whole suspension is gradually disintegrating. Okay, um, I'm probably close to time. Okay, I've got about 10 minutes, I think. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about uh, magnetic nanoparticle assemblies. So here's an example. It's cluster characterization in non-aqueous solids, in this case, heptane and chloroform. So, we have a process we call it competitive stabilizer desorption. Uh, I will show some in a more in a minute, don't worry. It's the novel route to hierarchical nanostructures. Okay. So we take oleic acid stabilized, oleate stabilized Fe304 nanoparticles. So the carboxylate head group is in, long chains are out, and this is dispersed in organic solvent. So the particles are separate from each other and very, very stable. And here's the suspension here in the middle. This will stay like this unchanged for, for years. We take, take the suspension, put it into a covette over some silica particles are shown here at the bottom, uh, or under a water layer, which is shown here at the top. And we pop it into the dynamic light scattering instrument and we record the hydrodynamic size as a function of time. And the hydrodynamic size here shown on the left hand side in solid data marks comes up with time. And here's the size distribution as a function of time. And here's the TEM of spots taken from that suspension as a function of time over several hours. So initially the nanoparticle aggregation is prevented by steric interactions between ligands. So you've got a particle here, a particle here, they have ligands. When they come together, there's an entropic penalty to that, so they repel. There's no charge in this case because we're an organic solvent. So these are sterically stabilized nanoparticle suspensions. Um, if we take our suspension, we put it into the over the substrate, allow it to assemble up to this time, up to this size here, which is around 60 nanometers after three hours, and then take it out by petting it off out of the cuvette, putting it into a fresh cuvette with no silica, we see no assembly. So the process stops. And then we put it back in over new silica, fresh silica, and the particle size starts to, whoops, excuse me, the particle size starts to increase again, shown here in black. And what's interesting is the polydispersity index doesn't increase. So aggregation phenomena are normally associated with the loss of size control, but not in this case. So our interpretation, this is old data, but it's, it's, we're still working on it. Our, our interpretation is that there's a, uh, an equilibrium between nanoparticle bound and free oleic acid. That equilibrium is very far to the side of the nanoparticle bound, but it's an equilibrium nonetheless. When you put the substrate in, the free oleic acid uh, irreversibly binds to that substrate, and more oleic acid desorbs from the nanoparticles, generating NP stars, activated nanoparticles, which because they've lost ligands, now start to stick together, forming small clusters, and over time, the small clusters form large clusters. So that seems to work. When we do it over a under a water layer, so instead of the oleic acid swimming down to the bottom of the bind of the silicate, it swims up to the interface and irreversibly stays at the interface between chloroform and water in this case, then we see this sort of profile here. So red is the hydrodynamic size, that's a function of time. The polydispersity index starts at around 0.2 and it drops all the way down to 0 0.04 by the time we get to a, part, a cluster size of 200 nanometers in this case. That's an extraordinarily monodispersed suspension. So in fact, the clusters are relatively far more monodispersed than the nanoparticles from which they were formed. So our interpretation of that is that it's a size focusing phenomenon. The smaller clusters within this cluster size distribution are, they have a higher surface area, so they're more prone to aggregation because the oleic acid is desorbing off them. So the tail of the size distribution is chasing the head of the size distribution. So this is one way, this is a, a size focusing way to make monodispersed suspensions. And it's kind of unique in clustering folklore or lore or, or literature, because most ways that you'll form monodispersed clusters involve some sort of external limitation to the size to which clusters can grow. For instance, by growing them in a micelle or some other polymer uh, assembly of some sort. So we thought that that was interesting. Um, more recently, uh, if I have time, because we have chloroform and water streams, we can actually do the reaction in a microfluidic, so we can push chloroform and uh, stabilize nanoparticles in one stream, water in the other. We form these monodispersed slugs, each one of which is like a little reactor in the previous uh, case. Uh, 
and we can separate off those clusters at the end and we find that the uh, cluster size is uh, functionally dependent on the length of this tube, on the flow rates, and in fact, if we, uh, if we extract, if we, if we take data as a function of flow rate, we can take data as a function of tube length. In fact, we, for all these experiments here, there's a single exposure factor which relates to the surface area of exposure and the time of exposure. So we're trying to make a process that will allow us to form clusters of control size just by selecting the length of this tube. Okay, a um, little bit about field cycling. So first off, the advantage of this method is that you can use nanoparticles of different sizes to form clusters. So we have, you can use eight nanometer nanoparticles, and we can form clusters, in this case, up to 60 nanometers in size. We add oleic acid and we disperse the clusters. If we use larger particles, uh, we use 15 nanometer nanoparticles, we do clusters in this case up to 90 nanometers, we add the oleic acid, no more change in particle size. So we stabilize this, this, the clusters, but stop them growing further. Those are ferromagnetic suspensions. So our, our interpretation is this, the particles are sticking together on the left hand side, we add oleic acid which swims into the clusters, binding to the open sites, stiffening up uh, the interaction potential, making them more repulsive. And because there's no magnetic interactions between the particles, there's nothing to hold that cluster together. Whereas in the 15 nanometer case, we can add the oleic acid in, it stiffens up the potential, the steric interactions are, are restored, but the magnetic interactions between particles within the cluster holds them in place. And that's confirmed by the field cycling. So on the left-hand side is eight nanometer nanoparticles uh, in black, and then clusters of 93 and 115 nanometers shown formed from those same particles analyzed by field cycling. In this case, they're stabilized by removing them from the substrate. The frequency, low frequency part in particular, which is dominated by the needle uh, relaxation process is unchanged, completely unchanged. So that means that the needle correlation time is unchanged in this case, even at 115 nanometer nanoparticles. In this case over here, we go to, fifth, go to 15 nanometer particles and form clusters up to 120 nanometers, the same size as on the left-hand side. And we're seeing changes in the low frequency size, and the needle correlation time is coming up because of these dipolar interactions. So these are ferromagnetic uh, clusters, effectively. So the nanoparticle size determines the cluster magnetic properties. Um, cluster size can be determined by when we stop the process. So the cluster properties can be selected by nanoparticle size for any given cluster size. So independently, we can say, you tell us what size cluster you want, fine. What magnetic properties would you want? Uh, to determine the magnetic properties, we'll select a given particle size and grow the clusters up to the size of the cluster. So in principle, that's an interesting way to make magnetic nanoparticle clusters for uh, MRI applications. So we can phase transfer these and MRI is underway. Uh, I'm overstating a little bit the, 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 the quality of the flow uh, of the process. It's still hard to do. Uh, we can't do it on a BART scale yet. So we're, we are still somewhat limited in this approach, but we, we haven't given up quite yet. Um, how are we doing for time, Pedro? Uh, you have still time. You have still time. I'm okay. Uh, yeah. About five more minutes then. Um, so a general route to hierarchical assembly. So here's an example from a good while ago again. Again, we assemble our clusters, iron oxide nanoparticles, and at the times indicated with an arrow, we inject uh, a DDT stabilized gold nanoparticle suspension, stopping the assembly because the, gold, the DDT is not subject to the desorption process. So we can cap our clusters as shown here up in panel E, at any size that we want by adding in gold, filling all the sites in the nanoparticle surface and generating a cluster of the size that we want. Here's the profiles of those suspensions. So in red is iron oxide, uh, and then iron oxide that's been dried and resuspended. Then in black is the, is the gold coated iron oxide, dried and resuspended. So the gold coated clusters are dry to re suspension. They're stable actually, it turns out, versus time. They're stable to temperature and to, against dilution, unlike the iron oxide clusters. If we take their profile and scale it by 1.12 in this case, we completely generate the profile of the gold free nanoparticle suspension. So what it says is that uh, the addition of a gold shell, incomplete, but a uh, gold shell of uh, diamagnetic nanoparticles does not interfere in any way with the magnetic properties of the magnetic nanoparticle core, uh, cluster core uh, that's forming the suspension. 
Okay, so um, I think I'll skip the final example. Uh, it's, it's, it's an example of magnetic nanoparticle loaded gels. Um, a similar sort of story. Um, we see no change in the, in the profile. I'll just hop to the, hop to the conclusions. Okay. So FFC and more, I hope that I've shown you. It allows you to evaluate the efficacy for MRI applications, but it does much more than that as well. It allows us to determine or to, to sense the magnetic properties of the suspended particles or clusters as sensed by the solvent molecules and, and reflected in the T ones as a function of frequency and the function of temperature. It can be in, used in situ for soft matter which doesn't necessarily survive drying and TEM analysis and magnetometry analysis. So in that sense it's complementary to magnetometry and to TEM. And the take-home message is that sometimes the profile changes and sometimes it doesn't. Um, now you wouldn't necessarily see that for a single field or single frequency measurement made on a conventional instrument, so you wouldn't get any of that information. And that information tells us something about the internal magnetic order of the nanoparticles or of the clusters, but only if you control the colloidal state. If you control the hydrodynamic size and the polydispersity, then you can get that information. Uh, and now we're in our group, we're now using that information to uh, stabilize particles, to make magnetic gels, and also to make responsive uh, lipid stabilized nanoparticle clusters for MRI applications. So I get to sit down here and do all the talking. The people actually do the work are, are uh, brilliant and uh, they work very hard. That's a good bunch of them out in UCD last year. Uh, collaborations in Otago, uh, in Munich, in Budapest, and also in Lampator. And then the people who provide the money, most particularly the European Union and SFI, with several grants down through the years. And thank you all for your, for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions.